Why an M1 in the iPad Air? Because that's the biggest difference between the previous Air and this new one. And a lot of macOS on iPad advocates would argue to death that M1 isn't even being used to its full potential on the iPad Pro. Only one port, no hypervisor, no windowing, including and especially on external displays. And settle down, nerds. Yes, I hear you. I feel you. Topic for another video. But iPad Air, that's not even surfacing Thunderbolt or providing the option for 16 gigabytes of RAM or using that ridiculous up to 120 Hertz ProMotion adaptive refresh rate, high dynamic range display engine. Just what in Jobs name is Apple doing? Well, I have some thoughts. I've been using the new blue version on loan from Apple for the last few days by which, yes, I mean, so many of the Batman sketches, so many, but also everything else because we're currently living in what could only politely be called the darkest timeline. I mean, aside from the fringe one where there's no coffee, of course, but as 21st century decades go, it's just the worst. It's going on two years later and you still can't walk into a store and buy a PS5 or a big Ampere card or an EV, whatever. But Apple's out here superhero landing M1 in arguably one of the best chips in the business in almost every flavor of Mac, iPad Pro, and now iPad Air as well. And it kind of feels like, what's next? The Magic Mouse? And it's not just that they're in them, but it's that you can order them and they'll ship in like three to five days. So yes, sure. If Apple Silicon team had infinite time, Johnny Saruji could artisanally handcraft bespoke chipsets for each and every Apple device with transistors specifically forged in the fires of Mount Doom for the exact capabilities they need and not a dark atom more. But their time is incredibly finite so they use their scalable architecture approach to design single chips that can be used in as many devices as possible, like the A15 in the iPhone 13 and iPad mini, which in the iPad mini won't use the image signal processor, the ISP, anywhere nearly to its 4K60 Dolby Vision ProRes 422 HQ capabilities, but still ends up being way, 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 way to the end more efficient than making separate chips for those two devices for all the devices. It's the same for the M1 and the iPad Air. Apple wanted to provide more cores for the baseline iPad, something they've been doing since A5X on the iPad 3 or A8X on the iPad Air 2 and faster IO. As anyone who's tried to pull those 4K Dolby Vision ProRes 422 HQ files off the iPhone 13 Pro will tell you, but M1 has two full speed USB-C and Thunderbolt controllers. So the iPad Air now has full speed usb three, generation two, whatever they keep changing it to. And I hear you commenting, I swear, if commenting could be heard, if M1 has all of this potential, then why isn't Apple using all that potential in the iPad Air? And to you, I hit reply and say, because it's potential, surfacing that potential still costs money. And more to the point, it costs us money. It's not enough to have an HDR ProMotion engine. You need to add the high refresh rate mini LED panel that displays it not enough to have a Thunderbolt controller. You have to actually build out the actual Thunderbolt port. Not enough to support up to 16 gigabytes of memory. You have to add a SKU, a shopkeeping unit, a model that offers that much memory. Not enough to have an image signal processor that can fuse across cameras. You have to actually add all those wide angle and LiDAR cameras. Not enough to have a neural engine with face matching algorithms. You have to include a true depth camera for Face ID. And all of that as a sticker price until you get, say it with me, an iPad Pro. Same reason, by the by, that the M1 iPad Pro has an HDR display, but the M1 MacBook Air does not. Because there are some people who wanna get pro-level work done, but just can't afford to pay pro-level prices to do it, or just prefer Touch ID. And Apple would rather give them, give you, give us, all of us, the power to do it, even if it means going without all the bells and whistles that usually come with that power. And let's just stop for a moment and consider that as is, the iPad currently starts at 600 bucks for 64 gigabytes, $100 even over the traditional baseline iPad sweet spot of 500 bucks and 750 bucks for the 256 gigabyte version with still no 128 gigabyte Goldilocks option in the middle or 512 gigabyte option for heavier users, all of which I would just love the iPad Air to embrace. But if the last decade of Apple product dev has shown us anything, it's that Apple uses the high end to introduce and pay down all the exclusive whiz-bang new technologies 
and then pushes those new technologies down to the mainstream and eventually the entry-level products as well, year after year, product after product. And it's great for Apple because they benefit from the economies of scale. It's great for developers because their apps can work to their full potential on a far, far wider range of products. And that forces Apple and developers to keep on racing ahead of us with even newer and better tech. So yeah, A15, like in the iPad mini, wouldn't have provided the faster USB-C speed boost that the iPad Air is getting. And while the single core performance would have been slightly faster and considerably more efficient, the iPad Air has a way bigger thermal envelope than the iPad mini to begin with, a way bigger battery. And I think for most people, especially anyone interested in doing more on their iPads, slightly faster single cores still pale by comparison to just having this massively more number of cores, specifically four performance cores instead of two, eight graphics cores instead of five, and eight gigabytes of RAM instead of six. Now, don't get me wrong, A15 is a cold-hearted graphical beast of a chipset, and I cannot wait to get its M2 equivalent into an iPad Pro and the Mac. And there is a legit downside with M1 being the same silicon generation as A14, that this new iPad Air will still only get the exact same number of updates over its useful lifespan as the previous iPad Air, where presumably the iPad mini on A15 will get one generation more. But otherwise, for anyone wanting to do or get into any kind of heavier workloads from multi-layer painting to video editing to audio processing to higher end gaming, it's just pure win. Also, while there's no new image signal processor to give the camera system a computational boost, and while Apple didn't add an ultra wide to the iPad Air's back system, they did mighty morph the front facing camera into a wide angle, but they did it to enable center stage, which is the fancy new neural engine powered conferencing system that's run rampant across the whole entire iPad lineup. It basically captures that whole wide angle and then pans and scans and zooms in and out to keep you front and center and then picks up and lets go anyone else who happens to wander in or out of frame. It's been done before, but never with Apple's silicon to pixel level of integration or polish, and it works just kind of all shades of flawlessly. But it's still mounted vertically in an increasingly horizontal world. Omnidirectional me all you want, but from iPad OS to the Magic Keyboard, Apple's clearly picked a favorite here, and vertical ain't it. Not like on the phone or TikTok, because of the phone, I get that Apple's already given up all the horizontal real estate to the pencil charging system and the keyboard smart connector, but I'd take the pencil on the top at this point if it meant having the camera on the side. And I could stop giving basically everyone on FaceTime and Zoom just the wickedest of constant side eye always. Why 5G, but not high band millimeter wave 5G? And to that, Snarky Renee would just once again say millimeter wave has so far proven to be as relevant to consumers as WiMAX. But I don't wanna lose my Canadian citizenship over this. So polite Renee will just, sorry, so sorry, say that for most of the world, millimeter wave is utterly irrelevant. And even in the US, mid-band 5G, especially with what they're calling C-band, is just far, far better for far more people. And it feels like 5G is finally coalescing around that anyway, which yay, honestly yay, because 4G LTE was blissfully simple and uniform by comparison for consumers where 5G is just an embarrassment of millimeter wave, high band, mid band, low band, sub six, new radio, frequency range one, frequency range two, C band, and of course, AT&T fake 5G. No human being should ever have to deal with that. Even knowing all of it, I kind of want to flashy thing it right out of my brain right now. Sorry. The simpler and more uniform 5G becomes, the better. Now, in terms of design, the 2022 iPad Air is almost identical to the 2020 model, but with a fresh coat of spring paint. In addition to the new blue, there's pink, purple, starlight, and space gray. Yes, space gray, like on the iPad Pro and the Macs, not midnight, like on the iPhone's non-pro and the Apple Watch, which is just why we can't have nicely coordinated things. So, cards on the table. Is this new iPad Air for you? Well, if you're new to the iPad or haven't upgraded in a few to five years and you want more than the 329 iPad offers but don't need a bigger display, all that higher end tech, and just don't want to pay that much for an iPad until you're making that much from the iPad, then the iPad Air might just be the perfect middle iPad for you. And of course, it has all the features from the new redesign the previous model got 
including the edge-to-edge -edge display, Touch ID, second-generation Apple Pencil, Magic Keyboard, camera system, and more. So make sure you check out my previous iPad review, ad-free and sponsor-free on Nebula, along with extended versions of all my Apple interviews, including their VP of chipsets and of Mac marketing, VP of health, head of privacy, VP of software, VP of iPhone and AirTags marketing, and so much more. Also, exclusive and original videos, including my new studio tour series, with episode one, camera gear, and episode two, mics and sound already posted, and episode three, lighting coming soon. Because on Nebula, I have the absolute luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube, but where I know, I just know, the absolute nerdiest, most hardcore of you will totally love them, all ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula, and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or just click the link below. And right now, today, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on sale for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of a discount iPad case for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series, like The Colorado River Problem, where a once in a millennium drought, 100 year old mistake, and generations old conflict have put the river and the entire region in crisis. It is the absolute best way to support educational creators directly and just the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than 15 bucks a year, and Nebula bundled in for free, just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this playlist for more, way more on the iPad Air, Mini, Pro, just everything. Everything coming next. Hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.